Hi, my name is Dr. Peterson. I'm with the Department of Radiology at the University of Ottawa, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the review of chest interpretation as we see them on, on films or images that we take in our digital uh, atmosphere. Now this is a picture of how we take a chest x-ray, and usually we take a PA and a lateral view of the chest, as you can see. On the image on your left, the patient is standing with her chest against what we call the uh, image detector. And the x-rays come from her behind her, pass through her back, through the front, and to the detector. Now, the reason we take it this way is because the heart lies next to the anterior aspect of the chest. And there's less magnification of the heart when the x-rays pass from the back through the front. The closer the image, uh, there, the heart is to the film, the better idea we're going to get is to its size. Now, the second image you see here on the right is the lateral, how we take a lateral film. You can see that her left side is up against uh, the what we call the Bucky or the image detector. So uh, when we take this film, the x-ray comes from where I'm standing or you're standing, passes through the patient to hit the detector on the other side. Okay, so those are the standard ways that we, we take a view of the chest. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the normal chest x-ray and these are the normal chest x-rays on this patient and you can see that they're good quality. You can see the vessels almost everywhere right in the midline. You can see the spine, the white part all the way through and you can see the black airway. Now we're going to talk about a few of these structures on the next couple of films. So we're going to start with the PA view of the chest and the first structure we're going to talk about is the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava. And here we've got an arrow there's an interface here. There's a line that you can see adjacent to the mediastinum. On one side of the line is white, on the other side is black. Now the reason we see this line is because it's an interface between air and soft tissue. If there's no interface, if there's no air next to the mediastinum, we will not see the structure. So this line comes all the way down from the neck right to the uh, region of the right atrium and that line is formed by the superior vena cava. The next structure we'll talk about is this little almond shaped structure which is just above the right main stem bronchus. This is the azagous vein. Now the azagous vein is an alternate pathway for blood to flow from below uh, the diaphragms up into the heart and the azagous vein actually empties into the superior vena cava. Next we'll talk about the right hilum. On the right side, the pulmonary artery sits in front of the bronchus and the two of them branch together out into the lung. Everywhere in the lung that you see a bronchus, you will see an artery because they're right next to each other. On this right side, the two of them can be seen branching together out into the lung and the artery is not separate from the bronchus on this view. Finally, we can see the right atrium here. You can see a nice sharp border where the right atrium sits. The airway you can see in the midline here, it's black. You can see it all the way down and to the level of the carina where it bifurcates into the right and left uh, main bronchi. The little notch here is formed by the aorta which we can see in relief and again the reason we see the aorta so well is because there's air next to mediastinal soft, soft tissue. This is the left pulmonary artery on the left side is different from the right in that the pulmonary artery goes up and over the main stem bronchus which is here. So the black part is the bronchus, the white part above the bronchus is the left pulmonary artery. And finally, the lower border of the heart is formed by the left ventricle. And that forms that border right there. Now, anytime you see a chest x-ray, you should look for these different structures. 
the more you see, the more you'll be able to recognize. Anytime you have consolidation in the lung, you're going to lose some of these borders. Now we'll go on to the lateral uh, chest film and a lot of, uh, of medical students and doctors tend to avoid the lateral film because they, they f find it difficult but if you concentrate uh, on the airways in the center which you can see here this is the trachea coming down and you can see where it bifurcates down below then you can describe the structures in front of and behind the trachea this is the right pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery, I told you, sits in front of the airway on the right side. And this forms a big white blob on the lateral film, which is about the size of your thumb. The heart border on the lateral view that's in front is the right ventricle. You should always look. It shouldn't be more than about a third of the way behind the sternum. If it's bigger than that, then the right ventricle is enlarged. This white area here is formed by the arch of the aorta, and you can make it out just very faintly, but it is a white area that can be quite distinct. This other white area here is the left pulmonary artery, and the left pulmonary artery goes up and over the bronchus here. Now this is the bronchus to the left upper lobe, which we see as a round hole end on. The pulmonary artery sits above it, and you can see the white area above that bronchus. The left atrium is the part of the heart that sits here, and all the pulmonary veins form a confluence that comes into the left atrium at that level. And finally we have the left ventricle, which sits in the lower part of the chest. Now you have to look at the diaphragms wherever you are. The right diaphragm is the one here that goes all the way to the front. The left diaphragm comes to the front but stops at the level of the heart. The reason we don't see the anterior aspect of the left hemidiaphragm is because the heart sits on top of it and there's no air between the diaphragm and the heart. So we don't see the, the diaphragm at all. So the right diaphragm is the one that goes all the way to the front. The left one is the one that stops at the heart. Now I want you to look at the spine as well. If you go down the spine, you'll see that it gets blacker from the top to the bottom. This is normal. When you have an area of consolidation, this will change. Finally, you look at the retrosternal space. The retrosternal space should be uniformly black. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about some diseases of the lung and we're going to start with consolidation. Consolidation just means simply solid lung. It means lung that is no longer containing air. It is of soft tissue density. So it's not going to look the same. Now there's two types of consolidation. There's consolidation that occurs without volume loss. That means the volume of the lung is maintained. And conditions that cause this are pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and hemorrhage. In these conditions, the air spaces are all filled up with fluid. There's no volume loss, but it is soft tissue density. Then we can talk about consolidation with volume loss, and this is called atelectasis or collapse. And there's certain signs of volume loss that I'm going to show you. This is a diaphragm uh, illustrating airspace consolidation without volume loss. On, the, uh, on your left side, you can see a normal uh, airway. You can see the major airway going down into these peripheral air spaces. Around the peripheral air spaces is some fine interstitial tissue. And amongst the interstitial tissue are um, fine capillaries. This is where the oxygen exchange takes place. This is where oxygen goes into the small blood vessels and carbon dioxide comes out. Now there are also some interstitial spaces besides the parenchymal interstitial space that holds these air sacs apart. One is called the bronchovascular interstitial space and then there's a subpleural interstitial space. Both of these are important in pulmonary edema and we'll describe them later. Now on your right side is a diagram of what happens when you have airspace disease. 
all of those air spaces fill up with some kind of fluid, whether it's pus or hemorrhage or just edema. This is what happens, and you'll notice that there is no volume loss. However, this area of consolidation is soft tissue density. And that means that the interfaces that have formed in your lung between air and soft tissue will no longer um, be visible where there is consolidation. Consolidation with volume loss looks like this. Okay, So on the left side is the normal. And on the right side, we can see that there's solid lung, there's soft tissue inside the air sacs, but there's also volume loss in that the lung is collapsed. So consolidation means solid lung. Here we have a patient uh, who has a nodule in her right lower lobe period. I performed a uh, lung biopsy on this nodule. And after that, she, had, uh, she coughed up a lot of blood. She had hemorrhage into the air spaces around the nodule. And this is a form of consolidation, which you can see here. Now you'll notice that there are little white speckle areas, which we sometimes see at the very periphery of an area of consolidation. And these are called acinar shadows. We also notice that there's an area of increased soft tissue density, and that's what happens in consolidation. Thirdly, you'll see that the diaphragm immediately adjacent to the area of consolidation is completely gone. In other words, we can't see it. We can see the diaphragm uh, central to the area of consolidation and into the costophrenic angle beyond, but right where the solid lung is, we cannot see the diaphragm. And this is called a silhouette sign. One of the other changes we look for in consolidation with airspace disease is an air bronchogram. Now here I've shown a low bar pneumonia and you can see the bronchus coming out into that pneumonia and branching. Those black branching lines are called an air bronchogram and that is another characteristic of airspace consolidation. This is a patient who has a pneumonia in the left upper lobe. Can you see what borders are missing here? We can see the left hemidiaphragm, we can see the right hemidiaphragm, we can see the right heart border, but the upper portion of the left heart border is indistinct, it's blurred. We cannot see the hilum either, and we've lost the arch of the aorta. This is because there's solid lung next to those structures. Now if you look very closely, you can see a black branching pattern in the upper lobe area, and this is an air bronchogram. These are all signs of consolidation, and there is no volume loss here, so this is probably, or could be, a pneumonia. So first of all, we're going to talk about consolidation without volume loss, and this is also called air So here we go. If we look at this particular area here, we look at a chest x-ray, we can see this patient's normal chest x-ray on the left side. But on the right side, we have lost the diaphragm. Okay? We've lost it completely. If you look through the heart, you can tell that there's white stuff back there, and this is consolidation. There's an air bronchogram going down there. There's no volume loss, so this is what a left lower lobe pneumonia looks like. If we go to the lateral film on the normal side, you can see the right hemidiaphragm, which goes all the way to the front, and the left hemidiaphragm, which goes to the heart. However, when we look at the left lower lobe pneumonia on the, on the right side, you can see all of the right diaphragm, but you don't see any left diaphragm. That's because there's consolidation on top of that diaphragm. There is solid lung on top of there, so we've lost the inter interface between air and soft tissue. OK, what border is missing here? Well, we can see the left hemidiaphragm and the left heart border. Can we see the right heart border? I think so. I think you can see a black line around it on the uh, PA view of the chest. However, we can't see the right hemidiaphragm. And there's a branching black pattern in there that represents an air bronchogram. So on the basis of the PA view, we would say that this is probably a right lower lobe pneumonia. Now we go to the lateral film, and we see one diaphragm there. This diaphragm sort of stops at the heart. 
That's the left diaphragm. So where's the right diaphragm? We can't really see it. If we go down the spine, we, it should get blacker as we go down, and we can see this whole white triangular area there. And this is where the pneumonia is. This is a lobar pneumonia involving the right lower lobe. Okay, what border is missing here? Well, I think we can see the, the right atrial border and the right diaphragm, and we can see most of the left diaphragm. But we've lost the left heart border. And there's an area of consolidation there, and it's blurred out. We go to the lateral film, and if we look at the heart on the lateral view, you can see an area of increased soft tissue density there. And this is a lingular pneumonia. And you can see it right there, this white area. This is a pneumonia in the lingula. Sometimes it's difficult to see on the lateral view, but on the PA view, if you don't have the heart border, then there's consolidation in the lung. Okay, what border is missing here? Well, we can see all the borders on the PA view. But on the lateral view, we've got the right diaphragm, which goes all the way to the front, the left diaphragm, which stops as a heart, but we can't see the posterior aspect of the left diaphragm. And this, then, is a left lower lobe pneumonia. If we go down the spine, it should get blacker as we go down. This one gets whiter, so th that's where the pneumonia is. What are the causes of airspace disease? Well, there are several that we can name. First of all, there's pneumonia, a lobar pneumonia in particular, will cause airspace disease. Hemorrhage into those little air spaces will cause consolidation. Pulmonary edema can be interstitial or airspace, and when it becomes severe, it causes airspace disease. And finally, there's certain neoplasms which cause airspace disease as well, and a few other idiopathic conditions. Now we've talked about consolidation without volume loss, and now we're going to get to consolidation with volume loss. This is also called atelectasis or So this is what it looks like. Again, the right normal diaphragm on your left and the passive atelectasis diaphragm on your right. You'll notice that the major airways are patent when you have passive atelectasis, but there's consolidation in the distal air sacs. However, there's some conditions which we should recognize right away which cause collapse. And in particular, these are an endobronchial lesion. Now, endobronchial lesions are what happens in cancer. These lesions are almost always central. They can be associated a mass, but once they block off the bronchus, they are associated with collapse of the whole lung behind that bronchus. So often we are faced with a collapse of an upper lobe or a lower lobe, and if there's no air bronchogram, because there's no air in the distal airways, everything fills up with fluid, then we have to think about a central endobronchial lesion. And the commonest thing would be a cancer. Okay, so there are different signs of volume loss that we have to recognize to diagnose collapse. First of all, there's consolidation. There's always consolidation. Okay, that's the whiteness in the lung. But one of the direct signs of volume loss is movement of a fissure. Now here we can see that the fissure as a straight line, and fissures will always present as a more or less straight line. This is the minor fissure, which has moved up. And the reason it's moved up is because there's collapse of the upper lobe. Now what are some of the indirect signs? We can have an elevated hemidiaphragm. As you can see here, it's higher than the other side. We can have tracheal or mediastinal shift towards the other side. All of these are signs of volume loss. Also, the main stem bronchus may move up or down depending on which part of the lung is collapsed. If the upper lobe is collapsed, the hilum and main stem bronchus move up. If the lower lobe is collapsed, they move down. Lastly, there are fewer vessels in the aerated lung. So if you look very carefully, you should be able to see that there uh, is a blacker lung adjacent to the area of collapse than there is normally. All right, there's some consolidation here. Where is this consolidation? 
Well, if we look at this view, we can see the left hemidiaphragm, but we don't see the right hemidiaphragm and probably the right heart border as well. And there's a line going down here. This line is formed by the minor fissure, which is depressed downward. And that happens when you have collapse. Okay. If we go to the lateral view, um, we've got consolidation that involves most of the right hemidiaphragm. The left diaphragm goes to the heart and stops, but we don't see any of the right hemidiaphragm. Also, I think you can see the, the stomach bubble underneath that diaphragm. And this is another sign of volume loss. That, can you see how the trachea is bowed over towards the right side? All of these are signs. Okay, so there's the fissure. And here you can see the fissures on the lateral view, the major fissure and the minor fissure, both of which have moved. And the area of consolidation, no air bronchogram in between. Next, we, we see another area of consolidation. And this time, this is the left upper lobe. We've lost the hilum. We've lost the entire heart border on the left side. We can still see the diaphragm, which is a little bit elevated. Mediastinum is not shifted, and there's not much sign of volume loss here in this study. However, if we go to the lateral film, we have a line. And that line is formed by the major fissure, which is moving forward. Everything in front of that line is white. It's consolidated. Everything behind that line is aerated. So this is the upper lobe, the left upper lobe, which is collapsing anteriorly. Sorry. This is the minor fissure, which is pulled up. This is the major fissure and the minor fissure on the lateral view. And everything above this is consolidation, is solid lung. We've silhouetted the entire uh, mediastinal border on that side. And what's happened here? Well, we've got consolidation involving all that we can see of the left lung. We've also got evidence of volume loss. We've got a tracheal shift, and the diaphragm is shifted up. And if we look very carefully, this is a complete collapse of the left lung. And the bronchus, the main stem bronchus, is amp amputated centrally. This is occluded, and that's what's happened. We've occluded the main stem bronchus, and there's complete collapse of the left lung. Now we're going to talk a little bit about pleural disease. This is pneumothorax and pleural effusions. We're going to go over what they look like and spend a little bit of time there. So this is the same patient. This is a normal chest in this patient, and this is after a pneumothorax. Now, there's two features here you should see. The first is that the whole lung on the abnormal side is collapsed. This is all air, and this white stuff in the middle is the lung. And we've got an air fluid level at the base. Okay. Now, any time um, you get a pneumothorax, you get a little fluid in the lung, you're going to get an air fluid level. So it just implies if there is a level that there's air and fluid, nothing else can cause a level. And you'll see that the left lung is unremarkable in this case. There's no mediastinal shift towards the left side, so this is just a straightforward pneumothorax. If we go to the next study, you can see that there's been a change. We've got two views here, an inspiratory view on your left and an expiratory view on your right. And you'll see that with expiration and even an inspiration, the mediastinum is shifted way over towards the right side. This implies that there is tension in the left pneumothorax and that this person needs a chest tube fairly urgently. The white structure in the center of the left hemithorax is the collapsed lung. If we look on a CT scan, this is what it looks like. You can see the air always rises, so it's going to collect wherever the most uh, upward area of the study is. So if the patient's lying down, you're going to see the pneumothorax against the anterior chest wall. If the patient is standing up, you're going to see a pneumothorax in the apex. 
Now, plural effusions, uh, usually not too difficult to understand. We usually get a little meniscus sign here in the corners. And remember that the lateral view has the most dependent portion of the chest in it. So if you're ever going to look for a pleural effusion, you're going to look posteriorly first. That's the first place you're going to look is on the lateral view in the posterior uh, costovertebral angle. So a little meniscus sign and a tiny one on the lateral film. Now sometimes the fluid decides to collect in the infrapulmonary area and it lies between the diaphragm and the pleural base of the lung. Okay? And this is called the infrapulmonary effusion. Now if we look at the normal chest x-ray here, we can see that the stomach bubble is right next to the diaphragm. But if we look at this view here, you see that the stomach bubble is well below where we think the diaphragm is but actually the diaphragm is just above the stomach bubble and all of the rest of that white area is infrapulmonary effusion. Now some people might not want to believe you so the next thing you do is going to put the patient in a dependent position and going to take another film. And this is called a decubitus view. And if there is an infrapulmonary effusion, the effusion is going to run out and it's going to collect against the chest wall. Now you can see an arrow there points to fluid and the second arrow points to the rib cage. In a normal patient, the air of the lung should go right to the edge of the rib cage. In this case, there's a whole white area between the two arrows and that white area is fluid. Here's another um, x-ray. We can see here that this is uh, an area of whiteness in the left hemithorax, but the mediastinum is shifted away from that side. It's shifted to the right side. The trachea is way over to the other side. This means there's increased volume in the left lung, and the reason for this is pleural fluid. If there was collapse of the left lung, then the mediastinum should shift into the left hemithorax. And this is a CT scan which shows exactly what might happen with a large pleural effusion. You can see the mediastinum pushed way over to the other side. So what's going on here? Okay, so we've got white out on the right side. Is this due to a collapse of the lung or is it due to an effusion? Well, there are signs of the mediastinum is shifted to the left, trachea is shifted to the left, so in a collapse it should move the other way, so this is probably a large pleural effusion and that's what it is. Now we're going to talk a little bit about pulmonary edema. All right, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about interstitial and airspace edema and they're two different uh, entities radiologically. Now we'll go back to our lung diaphragm. You can see the normal on your left side and when interstitial pulmonary edema develops you get a picture like that on the right. The first thing that happens is uh, the right heart pressure increases and you get outpouring of fluid from the vascular tree into the interstitial spaces. This happens in any patients with heart failure or other conditions and you get thickening of the interstitial space around the bronchi and the arteries. And this will cause them to look larger and it'll cause them to be ill-defined. In other words, you've got soft tissue around them, so you're not going to see them as clearly as you did before. You're also going to get fluid in the subpleural interstitial space. And this space communicates with the intralobular septa and other s interstitial uh, septa that go into the lung. And these form a perpendicular um, pathway into the lung, rising from the pleural surface. So during the initial stages of interstitial pulmonary edema, these are, are the two areas that are most affected. Now, we talked about vascular indistinctness. You get fluid around the vessel and around the bronchus. Around the bronchus, it leads to peribronchial cuffing, but around the vessel, it makes the vessel look larger and it makes it indistinct. So this is the same patient, normal on the left and with interstitial edema on the right. 
The vessels look larger and they're ill-defined. You can't pick one vessel out over the other. This is called perihilar edema. If we go a little further on, we start to see some more lines and different things happen. We get curly B lines, which are these perpendicular lines, and this is due to fluid in the intralobular septa of the lung. We get peribronchial cuffing, which you can see in the hilar regions, and we get fluid in the fissures as well. Now all the hyla are big here. The vessels are ill-defined and indistinct. This is interstitial pulmonary edema. Again, this is a normal on the left and an abnormal on the right. Same patient with interstitial pulmonary edema. Way more lines, sort of ground glass haziness. Hyla are bigger and the vessels are ill-defined. We go to the lateral view and we see some similar changes. Normal on the left, abnormal on the right. We've got thickening of the fissures here, which you can see, and the hyla look bigger, and they're smudged, they're ill-defined. Sometimes also on the lateral view we have small bilateral effusions when we have interstitial edema. Again, great films that show you the changes of interstitial edema. Peribronchial cuffing, curly B lines, thickening of the fissures, small bilateral effusions, increased interstitial markings, hyla are enlarged and indistinct. And this is just a blow up of the curly B lines, which are these perpendicular lines that f where fluid tracks into the lung from the subpleural space. Curly B lines again on the CAT scan, which just shows you these perpendicular lines as they come in. Now once uh, interstitial edema develops to a certain degree, um, there's no more uh, space in the uh, peribronchial interstitial and subpleural space for the fluid to go. So it flows into the air spaces and then we get airspace edema. So here's a picture of airspace edema on your right. You can see that there's peribronchial cuffing and there's fluid in the fissures and everything else the same as before but now we have fluid inside the airspace so this is going to lead to airspace consolidation and if the patient is upright this is what it's going to look like upper lobes are going to be fairly normal in appearance but there's bilateral lower lobe consolidation small bilateral effusions so all of the changes are in the bases if the patient is upright if the patient is supine, okay, like this patient who's in ICU, you can see that most of the changes are going to be in the perihilar region. So on your left, there's some mild interstitial edema. On your right, we have consolidation around both lungs. The lower lobes and upper lobes are less involved, but the changes are symmetrical and bilateral. Finally, if it progresses too far, we're going to get severe airspace disease, which looks like this. This is a solid lung on both sides, and you can see the branching bronchi into the airspace disease, and this is the air bronchogram we talked about. So, in airspace edema, uh, edema the consolidation is bilateral, it's symmetrical, and the consolidation is gravity dependent. Now if you're looking at serial x-rays from one day to the next to the next or even one hour to the next to the next, the consolidation that's due to edema is going to change. And it changes depending on the position of the patient and the degree of fluid overload. So if you have consolidation that is changing from hour to hour, this is pulmonary edema. Okay, so this is our next case. And this is a patient who comes in and is a little short of breath. What do you think of these uh, findings? Well, uh, the diaphragms are flat, aren't they? Can you see that? They're both flat bilaterally. And if you look at the right hemidiaphragm, there are these little slips that appear at the at, uh, off the diaphragm. And these are diaphragmatic slips. And they form, uh, and you see them because of hyperinflation. We also see there's an increase in the AP diameter of the chest, and we see there's an increase in the retrosternal space. Both of the lungs appear black, 
which is another feature of emphysema. So this patient has emphysema. Some of the characteristics are increased lung volume, which leads to flattened diaphragms, increased retrosternal airspace, and a small and a barrel chest. The vessels in these patients appear very small in the lungs, and there's a small narrow cardiac silhouette. And these are all features of chronic obstructive lung disease and emphysema. Here's just a CT scan example of the same thing, which shows you these holes in the lung. Some of these are bulli and other are areas of emphysema. Now the last topic I'm going to touch on is the radiographic patterns of pneumonia that we see in the lung. Now basically there are three different patterns of infection of the lung. There's a lobar pneumonia pattern, there's a bronchopneumonia pattern, and an interstitial pneumonia pattern. And all three of them are distinct. And all three of them are caused by different agents. So it's something that you want to remember when you're looking at a chest x-ray. Lobar pneumonias are usually involve one single area of a lobar lung. The rest of the lung is normal. In this particular case, there's a right lower lobe pneumonia. There's an area of consolidation there. And there's an air bronchogram there. We don't see the silhouette sign in this particular instance. Lobar pneumonias are usually caused by a blood-borne pathogen. And that pathogen goes to one area of the lung and spreads from there. It's almost always unilateral. And the commonest pathogen to cause a lobar pneumonia is a strep pneumonia. Now, lobar pneumonias are uh, um, an irritation of the lung parenchyma that is associated with an outpouring of fluid. And the reason we get airspace disease is not because of pus in the airspaces, but because of fluid. So lobar pneumonias tend to uh, come on quickly. And when they leave, they resolve completely because most of the reaction is fluid in the, in the uh, airspaces. Here's another example. Here we have consolidation in the left lower lobe. And again, we go to the lateral view, go down, it gets white at the bottom. We've lost the left hemidiaphragm centrally. This is a left lower lobe pneumonia. And this is a, another characteristic for the lobar pneumonia, is the air bronchogram, as we already said. Here on the CT scan, we can see a large, predominantly unilateral area of consolidation solid lung, no volume loss, and an air bronchogram. This is a low bar pneumonia. <clears throat> now on the other hand, bronchopneumonias are quite a bit different. Bronchopneumonias are caused by an inhaled pathogen. And if you just remember that much, you can remember what the distribution is going to be like. Of course, if the pathogen is inhaled, the changes are going to be bilateral. They're going to be asymmetrical because more germs are going to go to one area than another. And they're going to be scattered throughout both lungs. The lower lobes are going to be predominantly involved because when we inhale, most of the air goes to the lower lobe areas. There's peribronchial cuffing seen centrally because these pathogens attack the bronchial wall. They cause fibrosis in some of the walls. They cause inflammation in the bronchial wall. And this leads to areas of mucus plugging in the bronchus and distal atelectasis in the lung. But what do you look for on a chest x-ray is bilateral patchy airspace consolidation. Now, the commonest pathogen for a bronchopneumonia is Staph aureus. Because the inflammation is in the bronchial tree, it's much harder to um, heal. And often these uh, pneumonias heal with scarring. Not like the lobar pneumonias, which tend to clear up completely. These pneumonias are usually more serious. Here again, we can see a bronchopneumonia. You've got consolidation involving almost all of the right lower lobe, taking out the middle lobe uh, um, area as well. Uh, centrally involving the left hemidiaphragm, the apex of the heart is gone, and all of these patchy white areas all over, and this is a bronchopneumonia. If you look centrally, you can see one bronchus which is thickened and coarsened centrally. 
This is what a bronchopneumonia looks like on CT scan. Bilateral patchy airspace consolidation. You can see that one area in the right middle lobe where there's actually an air bronchogram. Can you see the peribronchial cuffing? All the bronchi are really thickened here. Now the third kind of pneumonia you're going to want to recognize is an interstitial pneumonia. These pneumonias involve the interstitial spaces, the parenchymal interstitial space, and not the airways. Gives you a ground glass appearance to both lungs. It's bilateral and symmetrical in most cases, and sometimes there's a halo or a cortex of normal lung. Here you can see black aerated lung above the diaphragm on each side and around the heart. This type of appearance is fairly typical of an interstitial pneumonia. These areas will be spared where the central core is involved. Also see that there's no silhouetting. There's no silhouetting of any part in the early interstitial pneumonia. There's maybe a little bit of an air bronchogram, but not very much. Now, if severe, uh, the uh, interstitial pneumonia can go on to airspace disease. These are called atypical pneumonias, and the commonest pathogens are PCP, mycoplasma, viruses, and different kinds of pathogens that are atypical. Here we have a picture of a normal with a very early interstitial pneumonia. Sometimes it's extremely difficult uh, for the clinician or for the um, emergency doc to tell whether there's interstitial disease at, and, or not. Often it's very helpful to have a previous film for comparison. Here we see some very mild interstitial changes in Later on this is what it looks like. Okay, so again you have the bilateral symmetrical ground glass you spare the periphery here, no silhouette sign. This is an interstitial pneumonia. And on the CT scan, just looks like this. It looks like ground glass everywhere.